Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Sherrard Show. I am your host, Sherrard. Hope you're having a wonderful Tuesday. And it's even better tonight, ladies and gentlemen, because we have a beautiful young lady that's on the show tonight. She is a celebrity actress. She's also a philanthropist and then also a filmmaker. And she's going to be talking about a topic that's very interesting. And when you see her, you will notice her. She is a daughter of royalty. She's from royalty. As a matter of fact, her late great mom, Olympia Dukakis, who recently passed away, she is the daughter of her and her mom has been in the industry for many, many years and have done many films. And we're going to talk about her story as well, but as well as her daughter as well tonight on the Sherrard Show for our special segment entitled Keeping My Mom's Legacy Alive. As Sherrard Show is brought to you by Essence Television. Essence Television is the network for the Sherrard Show. You can see on your monitor where you can watch the best episodes of your life, ladies and gentlemen, from Smokey Robinson to the Manhattans to Michael Collier to Tommy Davison to as well as the lovely Christina Zorich. That's going to be on Essence as well. You don't want to miss that. And then it's also brought to you by my non-for-profit foundation. Look at your monitor. It's entitled Sharp-Minded Cultural Center where I teach those individuals who have uh, autoimmune diseases like me, how to play the piano, how to read music, how to act, as well as have a great opportunity to do the things they normally wouldn't be able to do because of their illness. If you would like to donate or be a part of it, you can always follow the link on your monitor, or you can always email us at the show. Well, ladies and gentlemen, oftentimes we have great celebrities who have done great things in the film industry. But not often do we have great individuals who have done things in the film industry as well as um, the philanthropy uh, side of things and also who have lent their talents as well as their uh, funding to be able to make this world that much a better place. This young lady actually um, has, has a film, you can look on your monitor, short film, and it's about sex trafficking and how we can be able to uh, first educate ourselves on it and then also help to avoid it. We're, she's here to talk about that tonight on the Sherrard Show and many other great things. The lovely Christina Zorich, welcome to the show. How are you this evening? Hi, I'm good. Thank you. It's Thank you for having me. me. Oh, it's so excited to have you uh, tonight on the show. But first of all, to be so young looking, you've been in the industry for 35 years. Tell us a little bit about what the industry was like 35 years ago. <laughs> very different, very different. Um, I acted uh, mostly theater, uh, was a part, like worked at my parents' theater company and then in downtown theater in New York City, um, then a lot of indie films. Then I started doing, I actually started doing voiceovers a lot. And then from there, I, I went to, um, uh, teaching, uh, which was really interesting because you really get to see, uh, I mean, from a teacher's perspective, the way you prepare people, uh, you do coaching and then you do classwork with students and the coaching was where I saw the most changes because, uh, you know, the, the industry's radically changed in so many ways. Everything's self-taping now. So uh, everything's, uh, you know, you, you audition within the comfort of your own home or you go to a studio and record it. It was all in the room before uh, actors would read a whole script uh, now that rarely happens, you get scenes. Um, well, this is of course like the working, the journeyman actors. I'm not talking about the big celebrities. They, they have a different experience, but so um, yeah, it's changed. It's changed. You know, the interesting thing about it is you were just mentioning about how much it changed from back then. And you were mentioning about voiceovers, you know, a couple of things is quite interesting in the um, acting industry, as well as in the modeling industry. You know, if I get enough likes and enough followers on Instagram, I could become a model and I could become a professional actress with yeah. no training, actor or, with no training or anything. If I just get enough followers and likes. So you put me in the biggest film it's because I have more likes than you. How does that make you feel in the industry, especially how hard you work to get to where you are? Well, I mean, personally, there's good and bad that I, I can't say everything has changed negatively or positively. I think there's been a lot of uh, progress in a way because, first of all, me making my movie, things have been democratized in, in, in a kind of incredible way. The other thing that's happened, which I think is actually good, is that 
people aren't, um, it used to be that if you did a soap or if you worked on soaps or if you worked in TV or if you worked in film or theater, uh, it was really hard to move with from into another genre, um, it, it, not genre, um, venue, uh, uh, you know, because technically they are, they do kind of, you do have to kind of, acting's the same in every medium, but it does slightly, or there is a, a, a transition that's made for the different medium. So um, that's become more democratized, which I think is, I think that can be a pretty in, you know, terrific. Um, and then there's other changes that have been great. Like when I first started out, I was the ethnic girl. I was always like people, I actually had an agent say to me, oh, you're so ethnic, what that's like, what is that like? Now I'm the white girl, <laughs> you know, it's totally changed. And I think that that's good. I think that it's good that things have gotten, you see leads in TV series and they're not your typical type that we were all kind of, you know, um, indoctrinated that you have to always try to look a certain way if you want to work and, and things have changed and loosened. And I think that is wonderful. So um, there's been good and bad. Um, and I, I guess I'm going around the block to kind of answer your question because the Instagram followers and that is a part of that democ democratization that's happened. Um, and there's a lot of kids, like when I was coaching back in LA, before I started the movie and even a little bit while I was doing um, in at the edit of the movie, I would work with some uh, some of these young people who had gotten their reputation on Instagram. And some of them are like incredibly talented. The one trap I will say that happens sometimes is that um, they don't necessarily uh, stretch themselves to try to play characters because they're known, their reputation is kind of known as this Instagram personality. So, but that can be true for other um, to actors who have been trained. So, you know, I think there's good and bad that changes that have happened. Now, um, that's pretty interesting that you say that about, you know, the Instagram and, it, and the um, Facebook people, because for example, I have oftentimes have a lot of boxers on the um, show, professional boxers. And um, they talk about, I asked them the question about having YouTubers want to fight them because they have a lot of followers, millions of followers, um, subscribers. So now all of a sudden it tells them they're qualified to be a boxer. But for them, it's an insult. It's an insult because it takes away from all the hard work and training that they had started, heck, at eight years old. And now you're talking about at 22, you all of a sudden want to wake up and be a boxer. Well, so I think that if you want to have... Um, a career that spans the different mediums uh, that that process of educating yourself about the different mediums and becoming well-read and well-trained uh, seeking out those people who uh, teach uh, different ways of working than what you started out with and having kind of an eclectic ability is just wisdom, of course. And I think that the people who are lifers and are, are in this because this is their calling in a way that they're meant to do it, they will seek that out. You can't avoid it. If you're, if the people that are the, you know, for lack of a better term, I'll call them the lifers, are, are you can't wiggle your way out of the profession. You just keep returning to it, you know? So they'll find their way and they'll continue to be hungry for more information and more education. And, oh, I haven't worked this way and that's fascinating. Or I haven't done a Shakespeare play or I've never done a TV series. They, that's a natural kind of hunger that that's within artists' hearts. They want to grow and they want to expand and they want to get better and at what they do. So I agree with you on that level. It, there, there is that um that impetus and there are people who are in it for more you know i would say superficial reasons perhaps now what was it like for you growing up in royalty having a mom who was um god rest her soul who was a fabulous actress a fabulous human being and you woke up and when you were born she was already well into her career and very well known how was that for you as a kid well um you know i think 
first of all, my parents, uh, both of them, as I said, were artists. They were always, um, I mean, a lot of the work I saw my mom and dad do on stage when they had the whole theater company. My mom started three theater companies um, uh, up, up and down the Northeast coast and started working in New York where she met my father. And I think she, my dad actually worked more than she did. He, he, he got, he booked a lot of television and film and um, Broadway. And then she kind of started making some headway. Um, you know, she told me an actually kind of incredible story about that, but the point that I'm making is, you know, there was a progression that I, that I watched. And when I was young, uh, they had, they, they, had their obstacles that they were, which is why they started their own theater company. They decided, which I think if you look at a lot of artists, um, uh, the beginning of their like kind of uh, very commercial careers, there's a project that they either wrote or directed or um, Issa, I think her name is Issa Rae who did her own uh, Insecure. I, I mean, I recently was watched a clip of something she was talking about like, a, a lot of um, actors that's they do that one project or are they're in that one show and then all of a sudden that kind of begins their progression towards bigger parts and bigger opportunities. So watching that progression was was fascinating, but it was it always felt like there was a struggle. You know, it was it never felt like you were watching something easy. There was always. I mean, just the fact that there's constant auditioning and constant rejection and um, you have to really believe in yourself and you have to have a, a desire to look at yourself and evaluate what's not working and get back in the ring and kind of be brutal with yourself and say, OK, why am I not booking or why is the work at this level? Or um, And both my parents had an appetite for that, which is to just improve and, and be better and um, in their work constantly, a kind of incessant desire for it to, to, to get to a higher level with their work. So that's the, that's the, I think that's the most pressing thing that, that, that if I have to remember watching their progression was, was constantly being a part of clocking that and how, and some of that is really, it's, it's hard to watch. And some of it is, it really gives you a kind of life skill, you know, to be able to really try to really evaluate yourself in that way. So your, your mom and dad, um, and, and you may share the same sentiment, felt like no matter how much they accomplished, they really never arrived. Oh, Yeah. I used to say that to my mom all the time. I would say to her, um, you know, you have no idea like how privileged or, or you know, um, you know, not that she didn't appreciate what she had because she knew what she had. She would always say, well, I worked hard. <laughs> she would always say, I really, really worked hard. And that's true. She did. She did. Both of them did. But you know, the thing is that, um, a lot of times in this in today's world, actors because thing, a lot of things come so much easier than they did for us um, in the early beginnings. Like you know, when you're speaking 35 years ago, you're talking in the 80s, you're talking in the um, 90s. Um, you were mentioning about auditions, how actors had to read full scripts, full pages. Now you do monologues, um, and you can do them at the convenience of your own home. That means that if you get rejected on Zoom, you can just go ahead and turn it off and cry by yourself. You didn't have to just turn around and walk home with tears in your eyes coming from the thing. But I think personally um, that it was great to be able to go, you know, to the uh, casting and then see other actors and see the competition and see what you're going to because it elevated your game. Maybe that's just me, but what are your thoughts on that? That's interesting. Well, I think, I think that being in the room, you become, I mean, very performance oriented because you have to go in, give your performance of that part and, or your take on it. And then uh, maybe you'll get an adjustment and then you have to, and then you have to prove that you can take the note and make it work and make it beautiful and funny moving, whatever, or just real or 
whatever the, the demands are. So yeah, it's much more, whereas if you're at home with the self tape, you can definitely um, rework and work it and get coached and, and all kinds of stuff. You get to kind of futz with your work a lot before somebody actually sees it. So in some ways it's, you, it, it, it's to the actor's advantage because you can fix stuff. Um, but there is less of that experience of being in that room and performing, which can be, you know, exhilarating and scary and a, a lot of different things. Yeah, and it can bring out the best in you because of yeah. that in so many ways. But Christina, you've been being in the industry, and we're going to um, switch gears in a moment. But we're talking to the lovely Christina Zorich. Uh, we will be taking your your calls. I mean, your questions in a moment. Um, she is an actress who's been a very accomplished. Um, been a, in the industry for many, many years. And she uh, is actually, again, the daughter of royalty. Her mom recently um, passed away, Mrs. Olympia Dukakis. Uh, you see her picture on the monitor. She has been in many films, been around. She's actually been in the industry since the 30s. Is that correct? Um, well, I'm trying to think. She's, I think she got to New York. She was born in 1931. Um, I think she got to New York in her I think she was probably in her late 20s. I think one of her first roommates was Linda Lavin, she told me. And they had an apartment in New York City. I think she was in her late 20s. So she died May 1st. She was 19, um, 89. So I don't know. I have to do the math. <laughs> But, but, but that's amazing, though, because her career spanned over 50 years. That's one thing we know. Yeah. And it's phenomenal to have such a career. Now, um, for, for you, um, Christina, what has kept you in the industry through all the ups and downs, through the rejections, through the, oh, you know what? I, I aced that audition. I know I'm going to get a call back, but you never get the call back. All those things that come along with being in the industry, um, the privilege industry of being a successful actress, or model, et cetera, what has kept you going in the midst of all this? It's what I said before. I, I really think there are people in this industry who it's their destiny. I think uh, professions have, I think, I didn't think this when I was young, but I think we're all born with certain callings and certain uncovered gifts and uh, talents and you know, I, I think that there's a divine order to those things. And there's a reason that we uh, have, I mean, I don't think God's a God of confusion. I think if you are in love with some profession, there's a reason for it, you know, and there's a purpose to it. And you were born with that purpose. And I think that when, when, when it's about that, it, it doesn't matter. Like for me, when I started teaching, um, I needed to teach when I started in my late thirties, um, I, I needed to be kind of the grown up in the room um, and teaching permitted that. And then I got small directing jobs and then, the, then I uh, decided to do the movie and that let, let me go to another place in myself. It's another side of acting. It's another position in the, in the creative process, but I, I learned so much and grew and got kind of more stable and strong as a person because um, you know, when you're an actor, you're kind of like the kid. You know, you want people to like your work and you want your work to be better and you need other people to kind of help you discover how to get there. So, um, but when you teach or direct, you're kind of those outside eyes going, okay, let's help you work on this using this part of yourself, or let's help you develop this, this, the, this ability or this skill. So you get to kind of be the grown up, And I, and that was an incredible experience for me. And I, 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 frankly, looking back, I needed it. I needed to, to, to go to that part of myself and it, it really helped me grow as a person. So I, I just think it's a calling. I do. I, 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 know, I know that sounds pretentious, but I think a lot of professions can be that, you know? But, but I wasn't called to be a pickle you know, in a play. I don't think that I played pickle, but I wasn't called to do that. So you cut that out, Christina. We talked to the lovely Christina Zorich um, about her film career as well as her teaching. Now, um, I know I'm going to have audience members asking me this, so I'm going to answer it right now. I ask you this right now. Christina, um, are you still teaching um, acting classes? I was teaching, you know, the film kind of became um, very, very, very consuming. And I stopped for a while. Um, teaching also is like 
to be a good teacher, you, you really have to, it's exhausting. Um, you know, I've played characters that were on stage who, that were teachers and she, uh, uh, Anton Chekhov, I, I played a teacher and I, she always was talking about being tired. I thought, why is she always tired? And then I, <laughs> after, after, you know, 14 years of teaching, I was taught, it's so exhausting. It's you're constantly giving, giving, if you're a good teacher, if you care. Um, so, um, it was good for me. I needed to this, you know, it's very common for teachers to burn out. Um, so for me, the movie actually became very consuming and I, I think I could go back to teaching after, you know, once we get this movie sold, hopefully God willing, um, but I want to be able to do that as well as act, you know, and maybe we'll see where things go in the, in the future with filmmaking, but, you know, um, yeah, I mean, I love it. I could absolutely return to it. Speaking of film, so um, she has a film and there's the, you can see it on your monitor, ladies and gentlemen, it's about sex trafficking. It's a documentary and it's incredible. And it's called the new Ab abolitionist. Is that right? Is that correct? Let's say it right. Yes, um, you did it. And, yeah. and, it's, and it's very profound, and um, and it's a real issue. And I want to kind of talk about um, what was your inspiration behind um, this film, Christina? I met an anti trafficker at a party of one of my students in the Hollywood Hills. I think it was 2012, a Christmas party, and she was a guest of one of the students that came to the party. And she um, had was a nurse in California, and was working in a uh, in a hospital, and said that trafficked women and children were coming in, and that she quickly realized that there was no real system to help them with the level of trauma they were dealing with, and she decided she wanted to. Uh, she just fell in love with the idea of uh, starting. And I'm sure she went through her own process, which I'm, you know, I had no very little about of getting to the point where she could build homes uh, for rescued children and women to basically be rehabilitated after they had been rescued. And she was looking for uh, funding, um, finances, the people in the industry who would support the cause. And I, she told me a horror story and I was shocked that I had never heard of it at that point. And now, of course, it's a whole different kind of landscape. But at that point, 2012, I hadn't heard of human sex trafficking. And um, I said, I mean, it was a real um, one of those moments in your life where you kind of feel, I don't know, I, I know this sounds corny and it's going to sound crazy, but literally I felt like time slowed down, you know, certain memories that are very highlighted that return to us over and over. It was that kind of a moment in my life that I, you know, where I felt was like almost a turning point. And I said, what can I do? And I knew she needed fundraising materials. So I, I threw a bunch of um, friends of mine who were cinematographers and directors who could help film um, footage to help raise money for her. And they met with her. We did like kind of like a bunch of small meetings to, for her to meet with a bunch of people and all of them asked for money. And she said, Christine, all the money has to go to the girls. Uh, and I said, of course. And that's when I first had the idea about making a documentary about the subject matter. And I think it was about a few weeks after that, that she said to me, I feel like you're going to be doing something. We're going to work together somehow, or we're connected in this cause somehow. And I said, me too, but I don't know how I'm going to, I don't know what that's going to look like. Cut to, I think about a year or two later, I sold some property in New York. I had some money and I just was going to produce this play I, that I wanted to act and my mom was going to direct and I had a producer, we we're going to do it in New York. And then I just was praying about it and thinking about it. And I just decided, I don't think the world needs this play right now as much as I think I should return to this subject matter. And I was scared and a little shocked that I decided to do something that I, I've not really gone to school for, you know, to make a film. Um, I'd always wanted to direct at that level, but it was kind of cockeyed optimism. <laughs> I, just, I don't know how I 
vaulted myself into it. But I also will say that once I started, once I um, met more people who do this work, I realized everyone who's an anti trafficker, it's kind of a similar story. You think you're special, like, oh, why did I put all my money and jump into something that I, you know, have never done before at this level? And then I realized, oh, they're all doing that too. So I think it's more the issue kind of grabs a hold of you. And, you know, it's hard to like forget. You can't unscramble an egg. Once you know something's going on, you can't really just pretend it's not happening. And so I think this subject matter is one of those subjects that does that to people. Now, mom, why is it in the U.S. sex trafficking? It happens here, but why is it not discussed openly? You met an individual at a um, party in Hollywood Hills in 2012, but why is it that um, it's not front page news? Because it actually happens in American soil as well. Well, um, you know, I thought about doing a doc series because uh, one thing I learned in making my movie, which is uh, takes place in Southeast Asia, which is considered to be the most traffic region in the globe, which is a very hard thing to identify because it's a criminal industry. So how do you get hard, fast numbers on that? But I think each place it's happening, it, it, human sex trafficking kind of morphs into the culture, uh, to the political landscape, the, the values. And I think it does that here. And I, I think that in different countries, it presents itself differently because of their, um, you know, their history, their culture, all of it. So I, I really think in America, uh, unfortunately, uh, because of the landscape politically that we're all in, I think it's 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 still going on underground and there's a lot of misinformation and it's been politicized. And I will say this, I, I really think that this, you know, when I started to make the film, I really a documentary, I really thought, well, this is an issue we can all agree on. <laughs> there's never gonna be any arguing about this because we all love children and we all want, you know, to protect them. So I really feel like this, this, this is one of those issues that cannot be um, misrepresented. It needs to be vigilantly um, uh, addressed because it really is a no brainer. And it, we all agree, uh, no matter, you know, faith or political persuasion that this, that this has to stop. That's and I right. do think that the investigation of it um, is it is tricky um, because I do think that there has to be an active. I mean, it, you know, you hear about investigations that are happening, and I think there are more task force or more of a prioritizing it in different cities and towns than ever before. In 2012, it, it wasn't on my radar at all, um, but it is on our radar now. So I think that that is. It, it sucks that it's that long and now we're all talking about it um, and there's misrepresentation of information, but still, at least we're discussing it. So, you know, if, if life, you know, we have to take life on life's terms. This is the time when we're at this precipice. And I just hope that that it becomes a bipartisan issue and that it doesn't become divisive because that would be a shame and, you know, a, a tragedy. A tragedy. That, that yeah, a, if we were to do that to each other and to other, you know. Yeah, you it, know, it, it, it should be an issue that should be dealt with straight on, no politics or anything, because it's as real as the nose on your face and it just needs to be dealt with like that. And your film is looking to uh, deal with that. Uh, tell everybody where we can watch their film to be able to uh, educate ourselves on sex trafficking as well. Well, we are going to be in two um, uh, film festivals in New York, in, uh, the New York Independent Film Festival and Manhattan Film Festival. Unfortunately, I used to be able to tell people, you know, during the pandemic, we were doing online screenings because everything was online. So I could uh, tell people to do that. But right now, 
things are beginning to open up. So I would ask people to check out our, uh, our social media because we're hoping to sell it. And if we sell it to a streaming network, um, everyone can see it, you know? Um, at this moment, we have a website, uh, www.thenewabolitionistdoc.com. Um, you can check us, check us out on Facebook, The New Abolitionists. What's our, um, or Twitter at N Abolitionist. Um, and I think on Instagram, it's The New Abolitionist. It's, it's spelled the way it's, you know, the full name. But I would follow us on social media till we sell it. Um, at this point, it's not out for the general public. We're still doing the film festival circuit, but looking to sell. Yeah. Very good. Now, do you feel by doing this film, you're doing justice to those? It's a sad, sad situation because there's millions of individuals, uh, kids who've been sold um, into uh, sex trafficking. And the way it works many times, they, they switch hands so much, it's hard to get a paper trail on where that child is located before it's too late. Um, and there's a few movies on Amazon as well as Netflix that's talking about it. So I implore um, individuals who want to know more about this topic to definitely um, pull it up on, on Netflix as well as on Amazon Prime. But my question to you, Christina, is do you feel this is another way of keeping your mother's legacy alive by doing something and carrying it further, something that she probably um, would have been very passionate about herself? Well, you know, um, I think, I think as an artist, it's, I think it's unconscious. Uh, sometimes we honor our parents through unconscious actions. I don't, I don't, I think the, the, the passion my mom felt for equity and justice is something, and the same with, for my father, um, that, that's just an unconscious thing that gets instilled in you and it, it doesn't ever go away. So I think that there was, I, I know when my mom came on as a producer, I was halfway through the edit and I said, I'm not gonna be able to finish this movie. And I had a family meeting and I, you know, um, it was kind of bloody. <laughs> my brothers were like, are you crazy? And what are you putting all your money into this? And this isn't mommy and daddy's responsibility. And my mom just said, I want you to have this. I mean, eventually that's where she went. But, um, and she was, she was very proud that she came on as a producer. She said some wonderful things. And so I was, I was very grateful and that I made her happy. I think there is that primitive primal part of all of us that wants our, our parents to be proud of, proud of us. And I think that when I decided to make it, I, I did feel like this, this kind of light around the subject matter. Like I knew I was doing something that would be something that they could feel proud of. So yeah, absolutely. But most of the time they were telling me, I'm you know, um, I think the first time I mentioned it to my father, he said to me, he goes, you're going to go do a movie about human sex trafficking. I go, yeah, daddy, I want to be a part of stopping it. And he goes, how are you going to do that, Christina? <laughs> you know, he was rough, but um, yeah, I mean, I don't think it was conscious. I think there was an unconscious, there's there's an idealistic part of both my parents. They're very much about making money in the business and they're practical and they're wise and savvy about how to succeed. But there is this other side of them that might not be as public sometimes, but sometimes is that's very idealistic and very like the artist's heart that, you know, sympathizes with people and can see into other people's pain and suffering. And that part of them, yeah. That's that's something they instilled in me. It's a long so, answer. <laughs> Christina, we want to thank you so much um, for being on the show this evening, um, for just opening a little bit of your um, jar of magic, especially of some of the great things you have coming up, as well as the things you've accomplished. Again, I'm a big fan. Um, you've been in the industry for many years, and I've watched a lot of things you've done. I'm a big Broadway guy, too. So when I go to New York, I always like to take in a good Broadway play as well. But also definitely make sure you um, you you root for her and you watch the abolitionist, um, the new abolitionist. It's actually on YouTube. Um, you can watch a clip of it and give it support. Like it because this is something we definitely need to be a part of. And real quick, um, um, Christina, do you have any final thoughts? 
Well, I would encourage people. It's a hard subject matter. It's painful. And, uh, but I would encourage people to uh, get more educated and get more plugged in, find uh, an anti-trafficking group that they believe in, uh, do their due diligence. And there's so many different ways to get involved. Uh, you can uh, sponsor a family, sponsor a child. You can go on a trip with one of these groups. Um, you can start a business and hire traffic vi victims. You can pressure uh, uh, people in positions of power in our country to prioritize this issue. You can offer your services. There's all kinds of services that are needed with these anti-trafficking groups for the, for the children and the women. Um, so there's a lot of ways to get plugged in. And I would really encourage people to push past our discomfort because if we don't, I mean, the movie changed me. The movie made me much more uh, willing to confront head on issues uh, that usually would make me uncomfortable because I realized the only way this is going to get solved is if we do that. It's not going to, what's that great James Baldwin quote about, you know, um, I, I, I'm, I can't, I'm not going to bastardize it, but about being able to confront an issue. And I think that's the hard work of it. We really appreciate you, Christina, uh, for being on the show. Definitely, you. Um, we hope and pray she comes back again when the success of the film is global and she's back on the Sherrard Show. Just come by to say hello because I know what's going to be there. And on our next episode of the Sherrard Show, um, on tomorrow, we're going to have a fashion photographer who's been in the industry for many, many years. He's actually from Chicago. Mr. Ruby uh, Aris is going to be on the show. And then also a publisher, a gentleman who's a, publishers, a publisher all the way from Haiti who can, has published some of the biggest books you've read, they're gonna be on the Sherrard Show. In the meantime, make sure you uh, add Essence Television to your Roku device and your Amazon Fire, and we'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye now. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Sherrod Show. If you like additional information about our episodes, you can log on to thesherrodshow.com. You can also check us out on social media, like us on Facebook, look at our YouTube videos, Subscribe to our newsletter at Essence Television Networks at gmail.com. If you would like to get information to the host, Sherrard, you can email him at thesherrardshow.com. Once again, thank you for joining us and we'll see you next week.